Okay. So, um, welcome to the introduction to digital storytelling in the classroom. My name is Alex Everett. I'm the educational technology specialist for OTEL. Office is right over there. And um, our ed tech team, uh, the purpose is to, well, my particular function generally is multimedia production. If you wish to uh, do some educational multimedia, whether it be for showing videos in the classroom or in online blended learning situations, we can help with all that. We can do consultation, production, or uh, just general assistance. And um, yeah, the, from the instructional design uh, pedagogical perspective as well. But um, basically, um, my background is coming from four years as a student at the Digital Union, where uh, I did multimedia production there as well as, as, well as uh, support, you know, tech support, uh, all sorts of, um, every kind of multimedia that you can imagine from printing to video production and a little bit of web stuff too. But um, I also uh, assisted with the digital storytelling workshops there, which is sort of what galvanized my interest in digital storytelling. Um, I was a BFA, I got my Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Art and Technology, which is where I first had exposure to digital video um, from an artistic standpoint, which you definitely use some artistic creativity in creating digital stories. Um, maybe it's less conceptual, but it's the same software, same kind of things. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of this workshop, I'm going to show an academic digital story from one of the digital storytelling uh, workshops that I assisted in, in uh, Kenyon College. I'm going to explain a little bit about what digital storytelling is and why it's a good idea to use them in your classroom. I'm going to talk about the importance of using copyright free and or Creative Commons media uh, in order to avo avoid uh, copyright violations and in case uh, first, first, your first impulse should be to go out and shoot videos, record your voice, um, and take images of your material. But if you can't do that, uh, and I, I'll teach you about how to do all that, but if you can't, then you can go online. There's a lot of good resources that I'll go over for that. Um, if you don't have your own equipment, there are places where you can get it, especially here at EHE. We have a lot of equipment for checkout. Um, and a little bit more about how to capture media uh, from various sources like web, DVDs, CDs. And then uh, we'll tell you how to get in touch and have question and answer. We'll first, like to show this digital story. Um, I helped this uh, professor, Bruce Hardy, out at Kenyon College to produce this piece. This is one of the ones that they featured on the website. I'm Bruce the Neanderthal, and I approve this message. Neanderthals, hairy, stooped, dim-witted, brutish, you know the deal. A lot of this goes back to a guy named Boole who commissioned this drawing back in 1909, effectively ousting me from the human family tree. But did you know that my people ranged over Europe and West Asia for over 250,000 years? Probably not, but you all know we went extinct, just like the dodo. Just how accurate is your view of me? Let's take a look at the prevailing picture that so-called scholars paint of me and my kind. We hunted large game, but we couldn't throw spears, so we had to battle woolly mammoths and rhinos up close, which led to lots of trauma and broken bones. What does that lead to? Dead Neanderthals. We weren't bright enough or fast enough to catch small prey like rabbits, birds, and fish, except that we did sometimes. And we weren't that interested in plants, except that we ate them. We were big, robust, and active, so we needed lots of calories, supposedly eating up to seven pounds of meat a day, today's Atkins diet on steroids. With that much lean meat, we would have overloaded on nitrogen and developed protein poisoning. 
What does that lead to? Dead Neanderthals. We often lived in extremely cold glacial conditions, but we couldn't make tailored clothing, no bone needles, and we didn't have habitual use of fire. What does that lead to? Dead and frozen Neanderthals. So what do you think? Whether trampled, protein poisoned, or frozen, it amounts to dead Neanderthals. Except that we did survive and prosper for 250,000 years. And recent DNA analysis suggests that most of you seeing this carry 1 to 4% Neanderthal DNA. So why do we have such a bad rap? I blame this guy. Images are powerful things. So take it from me, my friend. Beware the power of images, lest you assign others to the Neanderthal fate. Brought to you by the Society for the Ecologically Realistic Portrayal of Extinct Creatures. Well, I don't even get mentioned in the credits there, but I, I helped him create that one. Um, and you can see it's pretty simple. It's just a combination of images, uh, really minimalistic music and uh, voiceover that we recorded. So that was part of a three-day workshop in which he created that, you know, having no previous experience with multimedia software or anything. So that's what you can do, too, with digital storytelling. Um, basically, a digital story is a digital multimedia narrative, um, usually told from the first-person perspective, but Obviously, Bruce isn't really a Neanderthal, so there's always creative uh, uh, license for things like that. Um, at the most basic level, it's just a slideshow of images and a voiceover. So you record your voiceover, preferably with uh, a nice microphone. Um, you can use the internal things in the computer, but it might come out sounding more like you're talking on a phone versus a nice, clean, professional recording like that. Um, then if you want to get more advanced with it, you can add transitions, music, uh, animations. If you, and, and I'm going to tell you some tips on if you want to shoot your own video. Um, special effects, you probably uh, want to have some, someone doing consultation or assistance with you if you want to get advanced with it, but maybe even interactive someday. Um, so these are just some rationales behind creative uh, digital storytelling. So a lot of journalists are saying now that video is the new text. So where it's still really important to be literate, obviously, but that's just kind of the first level of uh, higher education, especially now. Um, a lot of instructors are having their students do multimedia pieces, sometimes in addition to writing papers, sometimes as another option instead of writing paper. But it's just kind of a very engaging way to communicate media, or communicate rather the information of the course. Um, these digital stories, since they're told from a first person perspective, they kind of bring that personal touch that helps a lot of people get engaged with the material. Um, it can improve uh, student scores if it's improving their engagement, they're more interested, they're paying more attention, they're used to watching videos from a first person perspective on YouTube all day long maybe more than they're used to reading a textbook even. So it's kind of like just very accessible for them. And they're able to replay them and learn more from them rather than, you know, if they're watching a lecture that's not being recorded, it can all just go in one ear out the other and be lost. Um, so I can show a little bit of statistics on that too. Um, these are some representations of how student retention of information kind of slopes down as, as the class goes on. And uh, there's this statistic that there's been a few studies like this about how uh, students can generally write 20, maybe a maximum of 40 words per minute. And we talk naturally 200 to 500 words per minute. So that's 180 to 480 words being lost per minute. And if you're not recording something, that's just lost. But when you make a video, you can go back and watch it. If you weren't paying attention, you can watch it at your convenience, this sort of thing. This is a little example of one of these video playing interfaces that we use for lecture capture here in EHE. We've purchased this Tegrity software. 
and it allows you to put up a voiceover, PowerPoint, slideshow, webcam, video recording, whatever kind of multimedia you want, and students can then log in. It's automatically distributed to all the students in your class, and they can take notes on it. They can take time-coded notes. Um, they can see notes that you give them. So a lot of and they can download it, you know, from mobile devices. There's just a lot of potential for this type of media in the classroom. And just a little bit of background history on digital storytelling. Um, straight from the Digital Storytelling Program's website, their mission is to help the academic community communicate passion for teaching, research, and outreach through engaging storytelling. So that's. So their, sort of their mission. Um, they were founded in 2006 as a partnership between the Digital Union, University Libraries, and the University Center for the Advancement of Teaching. It was based on the model created by Joe Lambert, and we still work with Joe Lambert um, out at Kenyon, um, which they've been going on nearly 20 years with the official center for digital storytelling that Joe Lambert's involved with quarterly seasonal workshops, um, you know, summer, spring, fall, winter, they, they just finished the winter one and they might be offering a spring one soon on their website. Um, either open ones or sometimes with special groups. Right. So to get into using your media, um, there's a lot of obvious reasons why it's a good idea to use copyright free or Creative Commons media. The first one being uh, foremost protection from legal liability. Um, you can use you know, a little bit of a textbook or something, but once you start putting something online, there's issues with uh, putting copyrighted material up there. So generally, if you can get copyright-free music, even videos uh, and images and things, for your, especially for digital stories, um, you, you can get them from these online sources. and share with other independent artists and protect yourself from liability. Here's a little video that will uh, kind of exemplify this point. So explain to me again why, after knowing you for so long, I had to book a month in advance just to catch up for a coffee. Going out in public is so hard these days. What? Why? Because I'm famous now. I'm like fully a celebrity and everything. I have fans. They love me. I can probably get us a free lunch because I'm so famous. You are not famous. Uh-huh. My first album, the best album in the world, has been in the Jumando popular albums for weeks. Jamendo? You never were cool, were you? It's a music download site that lets musicians put their songs out under Creative Commons licenses so people can share them. Which means more people download it, so more people hear it, so more fans for me! <laughs> if that's even possible. By the way, if you give me 50 bucks, I'll autograph your face. Um, thanks? So, does Jamenda use the new extended metadata protocols implemented through the Creative Commons license generator? Extend the what in there? <sighs> Why don't I just show you? Where have you taken me, Mayor? I hope there are no paparazzi. I'm not wearing my sunglasses. We're inside the Creative Commons. Everything here people can share. Stories, photos, websites, movies and sounds. You can tell, they all have the CC license symbols. Oh, pretty. But you're still in control. See, you can let people use your stuff for non-commercial purposes, or only if they don't change it, or only if they share it with others. And they always have to credit you. And the CC website helps you to work out which license is best for you. And it lets you add information about the thing that you're licensing so that that information goes wherever your work goes. See? You can add stuff like your name and how to get in contact with you if they want to do stuff that the license doesn't allow. So, my name goes wherever my album does. No matter how many times it's downloaded? Yep. That means that everyone will know my name. Everyone will know my songs! I will achieve... 
stuff away for free how are you gonna make money off it just because we're letting people use our stuff doesn't mean we can't make money off it like on river it's a video sharing site that puts ads into your video and you get some of the money so the more people that watch it the more money we get and that's why my album is on Jamendo. people can share my music for free under the CC license but if they want to use it to make money Stay on TV or radio, they need to pay. The side lets them do that. And there are lots of other sites that let you make money off your CC works. Pretty soon, everyone will use our stuff. Every film, every advertisement, every home DVD. I will be rich. They'll all scream my name. The world will be mine! Mine! <laughs> oh, don't we just take it one step at a time, hey? Oh, I completely agree, Flick. Hey, Mayor. Yes, Bettle. You owe me fifty bucks. So that's just kind of um, a nice visual interpretation of how the Creative Commons works. They uh, described a couple of the resources that I'm going to go over. Gemendo for music and Flickr for images. And uh, they also talk about the different types of Creative Commons licenses being, uh, you know, usually they just require attribution, so you just put the person's name in the credits who you got it from. Um, sometimes they say non commercial, which generally we're talking about non commercial academic things in here. Um, and sometimes they don't want you to alter their material if it says no derives, no alterations. That was uh, produced for the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. All right. So um, if you have the uh, time, it's always kind of better to get to uh, create your own media because then you kind of get it exactly the way you want it. Sometimes you can find the perfect pictures and things on Creative Commons resources, but um, generally I, re I recommend trying to learn how to fish rather than you know just giving you a fish. Um, so the first step of uh, capturing your own media is the planning stage, which is really important, and a lot of people tend to want to skip over this and just go out with a camera and just capture, but you'll get a lot better final result if you plan out um, if they're going to have dialogue, you want to script it out. Um, if you're going to have video shots, you want to do storyboarding so you kind of know going in how you want it to look, and then it'll come out how you want it to look. You won't have so many surprises. Um, you want to keep the big picture in mind the whole time you're doing it, which this means like from beginning to end, you're going to plan, capture your material, then do the post-production editing. and so. When you go to do your editing, it depends on what type of footage you've got, what type of software you're going to use, how big of a hard drive you need. That kind of thing means that you sort of have to plan out the whole thing from the beginning so that you don't, again, run into nasty surprises. But um, basically, uh, after you plan it out, you go to record. Um, like I said, if you don't have your own camera, we have equipment loan at EHE and uh, at Central Classrooms that I'll go over later. But uh, when you're recording, basically you want to have usually as much light as you can, um, adequate lighting. Nobody likes to watch dark videos. Um, make sure you have adequate audio. 
A lot of people neglect to uh, check the audio levels on the camera. Um, they might not have any audio at all, or they might have really low audio. So you want to make sure you're getting decent audio, which generally is achieved by keeping the camera as close to your audio source as you can. You know, these have like a 10, 15 foot range on them um, for optimal audio. Use a tripod when you can. Um, you can rent out tripods and it gives you a much nicer steady shot. Uh, people are out there with their phones and generally people just don't want to watch that because it's too shaky. Um, keep an eye on your battery life or use extension cords and power adapters. You don't want your battery to die when you're in the middle of a shoot and you've got other people involved. It, that can be another bad surprise. So avoid that. And then when you go to edit, which I can actually show you a little bit in iMovie on here. Um, iMovie Final Cut Pro would be what you would use on a Mac. Uh, if you have a PC, you can get Windows Live Movie Maker. That's a free download for Windows. Um, and Microsoft Photo Story is another really easy to use free resource uh, for PC where you just drop in the photos, the voiceover, and music. Um, depending on you know, your budget and your time budget, if you want to go with the simpler software, the more advanced stuff, you can also go to places like the Digital Union and they have all these types of software and people there who know how to use it who can help you. Or you can set up consultations with us here in EHE. Um, if you're going to be filming people and putting it online, you have to have them sign a consent form so you don't get sued. Uh, uh, there's one for adults and one for minors. For minors, you have to have their parent or guardian sign it. That's really important, uh, so you don't get into problems with that. Um, FERPA is another thing to keep an eye on. We basically just don't put people, don't put students' academic information, addresses, phone numbers, things like that, or people get upset. And uh, just generally for accessibility, you want to try to caption everything. Um, Ken Petrie does workshops on captioning for the Digital Union. Um, YouTube has a, an auto caption feature now, but it's not quite accurate. Um, but you can fix them in that. But that's a whole nother uh, ballgame. So moving on. I spoke a little bit about these equipment loan resources. And I can put this PowerPoint up on our wiki. But uh, in the basement of the Central Classrooms building, there are cameras, laptops, projectors, mixers, microphones, everything that you need to uh, check out to do your multimedia setup. Uh, EHE has similar equipment. There are external sources where you can uh, check out really fancy equipment, um, nice cameras and tripods and things. But they will cost you a, a daily fee. So this is probably the best resource that I use all the time, is the Digital Storytelling's um, collection of resources for Creative Commons and copyright-free media. Um, just to show you that real quick, it's really nice, organized into actual digital storytelling kind of places where you can get information, uh, inspiration rather watching uh, other people's digital stories and learning how to write your stories and storyboard them and all that. All your images, audio, video, copyright information, um, and tutorials and things. Uh, there are plent plentiful bounty of resources here within these links, but I have my few favorites that I've uh, selected to show you. And we'll go over those in a second. Let's cc.net is another good amalgamator. Just lets you search all the Creative Commons websites for the type of media that you want. And so um, I think I'll go over Flickr real quick just to show you the Flickr Creative Commons. So I usually just go to the attribution license one, say Seymour. This is not like entirely intuitive how to get to it, because you're like clicking up here, clicking here. So you have to go to see more, and then you get to the search. 
So anything that you might want in your uh, thing, say we were looking for Neanderthals. <laughs> Here you have dinosaurs and cavemen. There's a Neanderthal. Click on him. So you want to use this photo in your digital story. You go to Actions. This is not entirely intuitive because basically you're looking for a download link. Um, zoom into it here. You have to go to View All Sizes. And this is always a good practice because then you can get the highest resolution one. You know, this is way too big to see. Even bigger than HD size here. But you can always size things down and not lose quality. But when you start sizing things up from low res, low pixel uh, images, when you start getting pixelation, things you don't want in your video. So you get to this with all sizes. And then you can just right click on it, save your image. Pretty easy internet stuff. I would like to show you Flickr, this other Creative Commons, pretty much the same thing. Gemendo is a really awesome website for getting Creative Commons music as uh, those little animated characters we were talking about. And so when you have music in a digital story, it's a good idea to try to have it be instrumental and fairly simplistic because you want to add a mood to the story but not distract away from the actual content of the story. You generally want people to listen to your voice and look at the pictures. So a little bit of music really helps to bring up the production quality, kind of make it more entertaining, and set the sort of mood that you're going for. But you, don't, you really don't want to have lyrics, because that's just going to confuse people when they're trying to listen to your voice and the lyrics. So when I go on to Gemendo, I generally search for instrumental music or ambient music. Sometimes if you put in a soundtrack or something, you know, you might have a particular classical guitar is, what is the one I just came up with. Um, but it's got all these genres. So you can pretty much find something that's specifically tailored to your uh, type of story you're trying to do. You know, whether it be a world music thing or the ambient ones are always good, soft piano, you know. Just kind of browse through them. To just to pick one, I'll try the ambient ones. And I'll show you how when you click on an album, um, you've got your tracks here. You can listen to everything. You can download everything for free. So you find something that suits your piece, and then you just click download. You can download the whole album, just the track you want. Doesn't require any kind of login or anything, so really nice website. Um, that's Gemendo. And I've also got freesound.org for sound effects. This is a really great resource that I use a lot. Um, it's kind of like beyond uh, when you get your pictures, your music, and you want to get some sound effects. Um, sometimes ambient sound effects, like in the, uh, in the Neanderthal one that we watched, they've had that alarm going off sound, and it kind of brings a more uh, interactive sort of feel to it. But uh, if you just search for sound effects, uh, free sound effects online. You'll find a lot of websites. A lot of them are riddled with ads and viruses, and they just have terrible sound effects. Freesound.org is really the best one. It does require a login, but it's a free account, so it takes 30 seconds to set up. Um, I've got my free account here. And then you can search for sound effects. Um, sometimes if you have outdoor scenes in your digital story, 
to have a little bit of ambient, you know, like birds chirping or crickets or this or that, um, really brings a nice like ambient, uh, immersive type of feeling to the video. So let's see. We have say we want like dogs barking. You just search that, and you can see lots and lots of of different choices. Good variety of sounds. You got your little play button there. You might think that sounds too uh, yippy or something, so you can really get exactly what you want. Just click on it and download it. So pretty simple. Save file, just like that. If you want to get some uh, Creative Commons video clips, um, the Let's CC one will do that. The, uh, this is the Prelinger archive. It's uh, a bit harder to find uh, video clips that are going to be specific to your project that are copyright free. Generally, people who are making videos, they want to sell them to you. But there are some stock footage and some things that are like older, so they're beyond uh, copyright already. That on the Prelinger archive, open source movies, I can show you a little bit of these. So, say we have, we're looking for an academic uh, subject on here. So that other video was kind of dealing with archaeology. See if I can spell archaeology. Uh, no. Nope. Anthropology, actually. All right. I think this is music. That's music. This is a book. I don't know. If, okay, maybe I'll try that other link to go specifically for video, open source movies, community video. You never know what you're going to find on here. There's thousands and thousands of videos. OK, so here's Anthropology of Religion. That sounds interesting. Um, wow, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on here, actually. There's a good chance you can find what you're looking for on here. Or you can video record yourself or you know, guest speakers. Curious to see what this is now. The Anthropology of Religion from Utah State University. I wonder what year this is from. So this looks like some guys, uh, some professor from Utah State's sort of uh, teaching. Quality is, is not ideal, but you know you can search until you find something better. And you can download a nice uh, variety of formats on here. Usually QuickTime will go straight into iMovie. Um, MPEG4 will go into iMovie, but maybe it'll be less quality. And um, I can actually show you a little bit of iMovie so you can get a feel for how you assemble images and sounds and things in there. Uh, first, I'll show you a couple more resources because there are a lot of resources for this, and I've gone through a lot of them over the years. Um, say you want to rip a video from YouTube. Uh, if you just go into Google and put rip a video from YouTube, you're going to find a lot of rippers. A lot of them you do not want to use because they'll, they're illegal. They put viruses on your computer. Um, MediaConverter.org is a good... Uh, tried and true, reliable, safe one that I've used a lot. This is cool because you can enter a link from a YouTube video and download it. You can also upload your own file and convert it right online, um, up to 100 megabytes per file, I think. You get a lot of different options for formats. It's all free, doesn't require a login. There's, you can get like a pro account if you want to pay for it. Um, so what I do, 
is go to YouTube, find your, you know, you can get a lot of copyrighted stuff from YouTube. I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> but um, a lot of stuff is just people just upload it. They don't particularly care if you use it. It's a good idea to ask for permission, though. Um, let's say you find something about anthropology that you want to use a little clip of in your video. Here's a short video about anthropology. Pretty cool. Um, copy the URL. Come back to mediaconverter.org. Go to enter a link. Paste in the link. OK. This is the part that people kind of get confused about. You have to go to the next step to get to this. Um, as far as video formats, you have some options. Um, a lot of these ones will drop into iMovie, but you want to go for the highest resolution possible. Um, if, if you're just getting a song off of here, you can just get MP3. Um, with a pro account, you can get higher quality, but I generally don't pay for these accounts when you can get a pretty decent file for free. Um, this one, it says Mac Linux MP4, but I, I think this is uh, cross-platform as long as you have, if you have iMovie, obviously you're on a Mac, but if you have QuickTime, you can play it. If you have QuickTime on a PC, you can drop it into Windows Live Movie Maker. But uh, without getting too technical with the jargon, you pick that one and click Start Conversion. And it doesn't always work, um, which is why I have other re the other resource there. Uh, it's working. This, uh, it, you have to be patient with this, but I'm not going to wait for it right now. But um, this little blue bar goes across as it's downloading and converting the video straight from YouTube. And then a download link appears right here. It lets you download it. You only get five per day with the free account, with the free uh, version. It's not an account, but there's that. And uh, the other one here, KeepVid, works in a similar fashion. Sometimes they uh, require a uh, Java applet or something for your browser. You just click Allow, install the little plugin, and you're good to go to rip from YouTube with those. Uh, Media Converter and KeepVid are the two that I would recommend, though. Um, Handbrake, this is for ripping from uh, DVDs. You can also use it for a conversion of video files. It's a good free video converter and DVD ripper. It's also uh, cross-platform, so you can download it, use it on a Mac or a PC. We have this in all of our labs and highly recommend it. Okay, so I think now we're ready to jump into iMovie and do a, a quick little story intro. iMovie used to come standard with all Macs. Actually, the entire iLife suite, iMovie for making movies, I, uh, GarageBand for doing, making your own audio loops or recording audio. Um, and then the DVD burning software, iDVD, the whole suite. But now they're uh, sold individually. So you can just pay, uh, it's like, is it like 15 bucks or something? It's pretty affordable, I think. Uh, you can just install iMovie. But for all the Macs that it comes standard on, you've got iMovie interface right here. Um, do you want to? I'll just show you kind of a real simple way to drop in some photos and uh, voiceover. Just to kind of give you an idea just how easy it is. I mean, the video editing software gets complex. You have a lot of different formats you're dealing with. But um, you can do it very basically, too. So you get your images. Either you shoot your images or get them online. I've got a couple of things here. Let's see if it'll take a Photoshop document. No, nope. going to have to go with some JPEGs. Okay, I 
I've got some JPEGs here. I always like the drag and drop method. Seems to be the easiest thing. You don't have to go through menus or anything. Technically, you know, you can bring photos in through iPhoto and then connect to iPhoto with the iMovie interface, the photo browser. But it seems to me easiest way is just to drag and drop. So you drag your photos in here, you automatically have this nice uh, uh, Ken Burns effect, this little zoom effect that's happening here. That documentary feel. It just kind of does it randomly, so it's zooming out, zooming in. And if you click on this little uh, gear thing here and go to the, say, clip adjustments, uh, video effects. Um, oh, yeah, here's the Ken Burns thing. You can control what part of it goes to in that Ken Burns effect, the start of the image and the end of it with those two things and click done. Um, I won't uh, go so far into the uh, mechanics of iMovie, but just to kind of really give you a basic idea, you can drop in some images and then um, you want to put in your voiceover. So you've got an audio file from recording your voice. You can come to uh, any one of the studios we have here or the Digital Union to record your voiceover once you have your script ready and everything. Um, you can also record on your own computer. I, I talked a little bit about how it's important to use an, a nice quality mic with that. You can purchase a USB mic for uh, about 30 bucks um, or come and use a nice quiet studio here. Um, but then once you've got your voiceover file, we'll pretend this is a, a voiceover. You can also uh, drag and drop that into here. And uh, this is really music, but um, that's basically all there is to it. Um, a lot of times you want to put, uh, just kind of showing you how you can uh, change the lengths of things because you want to make it where your voiceover matches up with the images. So you're talking about one thing, and you're talking about something else when it goes to the next image. Uh, you got text effects in here, video effects, all kinds of fun things. You got credits, you can make your credits. So it's pretty easy to make uh, fun, flashy things in here. But um, obviously, if the digital storytelling workshops are three days long, it only takes a couple days to start using something like this, and especially if you have people helping you. Um, so that's kind of the basics of that. And then you can share it, create your file, uh, export using QuickTime, create a QuickTime file, or you can actually share it right to YouTube from here. Uh, you have to have a YouTube account. That's another uh, free account. But um, let's see, I think I still have some more time. Um, I've shown you all the resources. Just to kind of wrap up, um, the next steps in going forward, um, sometimes I guess it can be intimidating, you know, all this new technology, equipment, and, and software. But really, um, just to do a base level project, I've helped you know, dozens of groups of people that are, have never used editing software before, have never used a camera before, uh, can barely use the internet. And, um, you, you know, just with a little bit of instruction, they're able to put together really nice academic or personal digital stories. So you kind of start small, start with a kind of a slideshow with music and voiceover. You can create really nice things. We're here for consultations to help people. I've got um, my email address, everett.63 at OSU, and um, my phone number. So uh, you, sir, you had a question?
Yeah, and um, you can do that pretty quickly. You know, I could do that in a matter of minutes, but um, if, if you have a, like less experience with it, it kind of depends how complex you want to get with it. If you want to do a, just a base level kind of thing, um, gathering your pictures and writing up your story probably actually can take longer than actually assembling it in the software. So uh, if you write out your story, what you want to say, you know, you edit it and things like that, um, record your voiceover, which sometimes can just take 10, 20 minutes, you know, if you are able to speak without messing it up too much. Um, but then, you know, selecting your images, depending on the topic of your digital story, you might be able to, you might already have all these images of your, yourself or your family or history, whatever you're going with. Uh, if you have the images, if you're searching for the images, you know, it depends on the topic, whether you can find them easily. But um, I'd say generally within a few days, um, just depending on how much searching you have to do, you can find your materials, drop them in there. Now, um, I mean, ideally, you have uh, individual pictures. They, they, they call it a monkey see, monkey do. So uh, when you're hearing your description of something, obviously you show a picture of that. Um, some people, you know, if it's just kind of a more amorphous, imaginative story, they might have pictures that kind of like represent an emotion or something, you know, that aren't like necessarily referring to a, something. Um, and that kind of thing, you know, it doesn't really matter so much. You just kind of throw all the pictures in there. Uh, but yeah, you can do them fairly quickly, you know. You can also, I mean, if you want to shoot video, that kind of takes longer to edit and everything. But. What about I've got a single picture, but different portions of it are part of, part of my story? How would I focus in on those different portions of one image? Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Um, I've seen some people that like to do uh, like collages. Um, it's just another way to represent, instead of the traditional like one picture after the other, yeah. you can, if you know how to use Photoshop or something like that, or you can have someone help you, um, you can put in a number of pictures, kind of move around the different pictures. What I was doing here, this uh, Ken Burns effect, um, I think, yeah, you could sort of do something like that if you just copied and pasted this picture. So now we've got three instances of the picture. This one would be, oops. This one would be zooming into one part of it. This one would be zooming into another part of it. And you could do something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a, a nice uh, little technique that I've seen some people use before. So uh, kind of nearing the end of our time here, but Thanks for coming, and uh, <laughs> we're always open for uh, future consultations, so thank you.